good evening friends. Let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity here. What comes tomorrow? Can you predict tomorrow? Can you predict what happens on tomorrow? I give two anecdotal examples which sort of summarize my thoughts on the subject. The first pertains to an event that I attended when I was in Singapore in 2010. An Indian, an Indian banker was appointed as a head of Singapore's National Bank, Development Bank of Singapore. There was a meeting to felicitate him. And in that meeting, he was asked about his predictions about the global markets, the future, the world economy, and so on and so forth. Now, this gentleman, very accomplished person, he is an IIT IM alumni, and he was also the head of the Southeast Asia uh, region of Citibank. When he got up to answer, he said, he was working as part of the strategic planning group of City Bank during the late 80s and the early 90s. Their job was to study the markets, analyze the economies, and then make some future predictions. And to give suggestions so that the bank could implement them and be prepared for the various changes that they foresee. He said he had an opportunity for going through their report, what they had prepared during the late 80s and the early 90s, sometime in 2005. He said his hung his head in shape. They made a lot of predictions, some of which came true. But what they missed out was, they missed out on the emergence of internet banking. The most important change that came in the banking industry, by means of which we can sit in our home, move funds, pay cash, all this was lost out by the best and the brightest of the biggest bank in the world. So he said, you cannot predict. Prediction is a hazardous job. The second incident, well, I will take you to from the word astrology. Probably you would have heard about the name Sulfikar Ali Bhutto, former president and prime minister of Pakistan. When Bhutto was born in January 1928, his mother wanted to have his horoscope checked. She went to an astrologer. This astrologer saw, he wrote the horoscope and told the lady that her son would become a great person, world-known, leader, powerful person, and he attained world fame by the age of 50. The lady asked him, what about what happens after 50? He vaguely replied, I don't see anything after 50. It might be a remarkable coincidence, my dear friends, but Mrs. Bhutto was sent to the gallows by President Siyah of Pakistan when he was 50 years old. So what do you believe in? The group of the best enterprises who couldn't predict internet banking or an astrologer who could prophesize about the Life and times of a world leader with remarkable accuracy. I would say neither is right. You cannot predict tomorrow. If you know what is going to happen tomorrow, all of us will wait for it to happen. You will not work to make it happen. You will not have the farms. You will not have any of these things that are around us. All this has come because we are uncertain about tomorrow. We want to make tomorrow a better and more comfortable day than what is today. When I was told about what I was to speak about, I thought, did I have a passion? I suppose yes. During my childhood days, or during my teenage days, I thought, I dreamt, I read, I played cricket. Cricket was my life. Like many other youngsters in my circle, we all had one ambition, play for India, nothing else. But there are a lot of other thousands of similar youngsters in the country who all wanted to play for India. You know the story of Sachin Tendulkar or Rahul Dravid or Anil Kumble, who all put in more than 10 or 12 hours of practice a day for about four or five years and made the grade. Probably some of you would know what a lot of the first class cricketers who did not make the international grade but still managed to manage to play the game at some level and earn a living out of it. Have you heard about those who just didn't make the grade at all? Probably you haven't. They were good, they made the sacrifices, they had the talent, they put in the effort, but finally when the list is taken, they didn't make the grade. What happened to them? There's a book by Ashwada Yapa called When God Holds a Googly, which lists out the travails and tribulations of a person who was wedded to cricket, who was devoted to cricket, who made sacrifices for cricket, who unfortunately made cricket. No, I, I speak about cricket when I say about passion. I speak about cricket because I feel it mirrors life more than any other sport of game. In cricket, it essentially a battle between bat and ball. But you find that the batsman is alone at the wicket. He tests his skills against 11 players on the opposite side, one of whom has the ball with him. 
like similarly in life, you come alone, you face the challenges alone. You may get support from your parents, from your spouse, from your friends, from your children and so on and so forth. But when it comes to a challenge, you face it alone. Same in cricket, you face the ball alone. All the advice, all the support is only nature of support. Which ultimately doesn't mean anything when the bowler has the ball in your hands. Now what happens if you follow your passion without having the building blocks? I'm sorry, you're going to fail. Why? Because of certain things which you lose out if your basics are not right. What are they? The first time says, what should be prepared? We all think we are prepared. How good is the preparation coming? So when you go for an exam, you are prepared, you study studied well, don't you feel some amount of tension within you? When you go for playing a game, when you go for a sport, you are also tense. Even Vijay Merchant, who had played so, many, so much cricket inside and outside the country, felt that he always felt a knot in his stomach when he went out to patch. That was a nervous energy being released. It is good because it releases the adrenaline and it sort of improves your mental and physical faculty. But there is something else. We all remember what happened to Karna, the character in Mahabharata. Wonderful warrior. But at a critical time in the Mahabharata war, he was affected by the curse. He forgot what he had learned. We are all worried. What happens if I fail? What happens if I forget what I studied? So this is a small fear that is lurking deep within us. But at times you find that this can overtake and overwhelm you. There is an example of an internal player called Mark Karpatas. He was an excellent batsman, made centuries by the dozen in county cricket. But when it came to test cricket, somehow he couldn't convert his 20s and 30s into 50s and 100s. He was given a lot of opportunities. Every time he would play well, he would bat for some time, get settled, everything, and then get out. Finally, he consulted a sports psychologist. He asked Karpatas, what do you think when you go to bat in a test match? He said, I don't want to fail. What do you think when you go to bat in a county match? I don't think anything. I know I can do well, so I am relaxed. So this is the basic difference. For Mark Kramprakash, the essential thing when he went to play in a test match was, I should not fail. So the psychologist told him, you go to the ground the day before. You finish your nets, you go and sit for some time near the pitch. You think about what you will do tomorrow. You think about scoring boundaries, you think about scoring runs. You think about the cheers you get when you complete your century. You think all that, you envision all that, you keep it in your mind, go to your hotel and sleep. And come back the next day and play the game. Ram Prakash did exactly as he was told. After the practice, he went, he sat by the pitch, he talked, made all these positive thoughts, these positive thoughts were written in his mind, he went, he slept, next day he went to battle the positive energy and he scored a century. That was the turning point in his career. So what happens is that even if you are prepared, if you think you are prepared physically or by way of academics, you need to be mentally attuned. You need to be mentally prepared. Without mental preparation, the chance of failure is always there. Second aspect is inability to handle failure. Or rather a failure to handle failure. Failure is a demon who will occupy as much space in your mind as you allow it to. South Africans, probably the best team in world cricket for a long time, they never won the World Cup. We laugh at them saying, oh, they are chokers. What happens to them? Every time from a winning situation, somewhere in the semi-finals or before that, they manage to lose. They see victories within grasp. They fail to achieve it. We can't just set about your mental ability or your mental energy being there at 15 kilometers. The last 6 <coughs> kilometers are run through the mind. Similarly, if victory is something within grasp, all you have to do is to keep your head down and work according to the plan. You try to rush it, you're doomed. South Africans haven't yet mastered the art. Not just a team. Think about Sachin Tendulkar, which hundred centuries in international cricket. He made his 99th century during the 2011 World Cup. Next century took almost two years. What happened? Once in a test match in Bombay, he was batting on 70. And then the next day, the entire Bombay turned up to watch his 100th century. Score reached 94. He was a 94 and he suddenly saw the score and said, Oh, just six runs more. And then his speed stopped and he got more. After that, when he finally accomplished the feat of his 100th century against Bangladesh, he said, the last 10 runs from 90 to 100 were the most difficult 10 runs I made in my whole career. 
rise and score cricket or test cricket. So just imagine a player of his standing who has scored 100 centuries in international cricket, the last 10 runs of his last century were the most difficult ones. That is because he had allowed those failures of not being able to convert the other knocks into centuries to become a demon that was conquering. So if you allow space for a failure to grow, it will gnaw into you, it will grow inside you and it will conquer you. You should learn to delete failures. Failure can be of any type. You can lose an election when you propose to a loud one and he or she rejects, that's a failure. You can fail an exam. But you need to delete that from the mind. Suppose you propose and she, he or she says no, you will be able to laugh it off after three years. It may look like a big thing today, but tomorrow it's another day. So, people or the successful people manage to delete failures from their mind and then leave for the day and take forward the fight tomorrow. The third is adaptability. Cricket is a wonderful game in the sense that no other game is influenced so much by the conditions and surroundings as cricket is. You have a pitch, it can be uh, have a lot of grass, it can be underprepared, it can be a batting wicket, it can be a pata wicket, you can have the wind blowing, you can have a cloud cover, it can be hot and humid like in India or it can be cold and windy like in New Zealand. A cricket is expected to adapt to all these conditions. Plus there are the three formats of the game, the longer version, the limited overs and the T20. How does he accomplish all that? It is a mindset. Sunil Gavaskar was one of the best batsmen India produced. In the first World Cup in 1975, in the very first match against England, India made in 60 overs just 132 runs. Our man Gavaskar batted through the entire innings, faced 174 balls and scored 36. It was a pathetic performance. As he himself confessed later on, he had a mind block. He couldn't get out of it. So he had to adjust his game, he had to adjust his technique and adapt. He managed that. In the penultimate match of his career in 1987 against New Zealand, he scored a century in 87 balls. That is how difficult it is even for people at that level to adjust. I would say that's a question of moving out of the comfort zone also. I would say the example of two friends of mine from my medical college days. Both did their MD in general medicine. Both were doing well in their practice in small towns in North Kerala. One of them suddenly said, I want to go to England and do MRC. You know, Masim, are you crazy? MRCP is equal, your MD is equal to MRCP. Why do you want to get a foreign degree? He said, no, I want to do that. He went to England and he struggled. Initial four or five years, it was a total struggle. Money was in the job was difficult. Conditions were difficult. After five years, he got his MRCP. He joined some place in the up and coming speciality. When he came back to India after 10 years, he was the acknowledged experts internationally in that field. Today, not one international conference goes without he presenting a paper. The other person, equally good, still continues with his practice. Where there were three physicians in that town in 1991, now there are 30. So from one in three, he has become one in 30, inside a small town. Whereas the other person has become one of the top. How did he achieve it? Because he moved out of his comfort zone. He made the necessary sacrifices. So when you follow your passion, be prepared to make the necessary sacrifice. Be prepared to move out of your comfort zone. Only then, only if you are willing to do that, would you be able to achieve your passion. Next is regarding composure. Have you seen Sachin Tadilkar bat? Do you see any emotions on his face? You know players don't sledge Tadilkar because there's no point sledge. I had an incident. I'll record that. I became an umpire quite early in life. I was only 26 when I umpired my first Ranji Trophy match. It was in a place called Ranchi and the match was between Bihar and Tripura. Before the match, there was a lineup and some of the players asked who is the umpire. They pointed to me. And he said, hey, Pecha hai. In any other, this thing, being young and slim is a positive thing. But an umpire is supposed to be old, fat and body, which I was not at that point of time. Anyway, this Bihar had prepared a turning track for one of the spinners called Ashwini Kumar. And I was praying that my debut, Lord Let Ashwini Kumar, hold from my end. Unfortunately, started and started bowling for my game. In the first over, there was an appeal. I turned it down. He glared at me and went. Second over, there was a big appeal for catch. Everyone was jumping up and down. I said, not out. I could hear a pin drop. He took two steps towards me and asked, Antha, yeah, are you blind? I kept a very straight face. He took one more step closer to me and asked, Antha, yeah, are you blind? 
and again kept a very straight face. He turned around and announced, "This is Vandana. He's not just He's not just blind. He's also deaf." But I mean, wonderfully hilarious. If I was not the object of ridicule, I somehow kept a straight face and continued. After two three hours, the captain on the side came to me and told me, "You missed that hitch." So I gathered all the command in my voice and told him, "Captain Sir, you should be knowing by now that when I say not out, there is no hitch." He looked at me. I held the gaze and he said, "Okay, sir." From that point onwards, they stopped those excessive feelings. I believe that if you are calm and composed, or you give an impression of being calm and composed, the other side will respect. Whereas if you are being excitable, if you show that you are the reacting type, you lose your temper, you lose your balance, you will lose the plot. Finally, the issue of relaxation. Even in the middle of a match, players know how to relax. The success of great players is that they could relax, they can switch off in between, in between their innings. There's a player who follows the route of a sparrow. Vivian Richards will whistle at the crease. There's so many ways in which people relax. In life, you should learn how to relax. There's so many stresses and strain in life. Now, he said about running. It's a wonderful sport. There is yoga to be done. You can read, you paint, whatever is there. Do a hobby. Find a hobby so that that gives you a sense of happiness. That gives you a sense of achievement. You can switch off from whatever else is your job and focus on your happy a hobby and be a happier and a better person. This is what I would say, my dear friends. You need a passion. I wouldn't say you don't need a passion. You need a passion. You have to be passionate about something. Only passion can light up your lives. Only passion can make create the fire inside you. Only passion can motivate you. But don't let passion drive you. Instead, drive your passion and be successful. Thank you very much.